And welcome to week six. And uh, week six, we're going to get into audio uh, because uh, this is a topic that simply cannot be ignored. It's incredibly important uh, to have good audio for video. In fact, uh, it has been said that uh, an audience will forgive errors in video sooner than they'll forgive errors in audio. And let's face it, if you've got a, a video that's slightly overexposed, uh, that may not be as much of a problem as if you can't hear what someone's saying. Or if, if the audio is distorted or there's an annoying buzzing sound, uh, that sort of thing. And so it's really important that we, uh, we pay attention to audio. And the study of audio is the study of acoustics. Acoustics is the science of audio, uh, which we will get into. Okay, what is sound? And we, uh, we began lighting by asking, what is light? This is basically almost the same lecture, but in a slightly different way. And we will compare sound to light. Sound is vibration. Uh, just like light is radiation, sound is vibration. Two very fundamentally different things. Uh, sound cannot occur in a vacuum. Radiation can. Uh, we can see the stars. The, light, the light from the stars travels through the vacuum of space. Sound does not. In space, no one can hear you scream, as uh, the Alien movie uh, depicted. Even though you heard a lot of people scream in the Alien movie, didn't you? Okay. Air carries sound, but so can water and other surfaces. So essentially, anything that's capable of vibrating or resonating uh, can carry sound. And so, for example... Uh, if you've ever played the game where you tie the string to the, the little paper cup or something like that, and you talk into one hand and someone's listening in the other hand, you know, across the room, and they can hear what you're saying, that's because the string is vibrating and it's vibrating the cup, which is vibrating the air, that sort of thing. And so even solid objects can carry sound. Uh, air is the, the most common conductor of sound, but water can as well. Uh, sound waves occur when something vibrates the air, uh, whatever it is. You know, it can be a very obvious vibration, it can be a firecracker going off, or it could be somebody whispering. It's still creating a vibration somewhere. And we hear sound when the air vibrates our eardrum. And so the human ear uh, has those little bitty tiny parts that vibrate uh, when sound hits them. And uh, that's what our brain interprets as sound. That's how we can hear things. And so obviously we need air to do that. Uh, sound varies in frequency and energy. Now that's an important thing to understand. If you've ever been uh, next to someone uh, in, uh, out driving and someone's next to you at a traffic light and they've got their music playing way, way too loud and all you hear of it is a buzzing sound. What's happening is you're hearing the lower frequencies because those are stronger than the upper frequencies. And so uh, you will typically hear those longer. And also, obviously, the more vo volume the sound has, the, the bigger the vibration is going to be. And yes, you can damage your eardrums if you listen to too much loud sound. And there are two things that sound can do when it strikes an object. Just like there are, well, actually, there are three things that light can do when it strikes an object. Really, there are only two things that sound can do. Sound can be absorbed. Uh, that's one of the things that can happen when sound hits an object. And when sound strikes an object and it stops, uh, that's, uh, that's basically called sound dampening. Uh, sound is being stopped. And so the effect there is that we hear silence. And the ear defenders that you typically buy, it's like if you're, if you're the, mowing your lawn or if you're going to a shooting range, or you're going to some uh, loud situation, you put those, those things that look like headphones, really all that is is foam rubber. And what that's doing is it's providing a soft material which will pad the sound. A room with soft walls, or some kind of a soft surface, has no echoes. Now the examples that I have here are some very extreme examples. Now you've seen the... Uh, the insulating padding on our sound booth, I assume, which looks something like this, except it's a whole lot smaller. And so any soft padding will cause uh, sound to, to anti-echo and get absorbed and basically die away. And obviously, if you take it to this kind of extreme, you will get the quietest room in the world. And this is another of the quietest rooms in the world. I think it looked very different to me, but let's pretend they're the same room. Uh, this has a similar 
uh, feature there where you can see these soft spikes coming out. And uh, that will basically remove all echoes altogether from whatever it is you're hearing. Uh, now, this is an interesting situation. We actually need some echoes in order to, uh, to hear properly. A room with no echoes is considered dead. Or let's say a room with few echoes. If you have a room that's, that's, uh, that's very sound dampened, that's got some nice, good uh, soundproofing on the walls, uh, af after a certain point, you would call the room dead because you're not getting any echoes, uh, any significant echoes. And that can actually be, can work against you because uh, then suddenly everybody sounds quiet because the sound is not being reinforced. It's like if you're singing in the shower, so to speak, uh, you have the opposite effect where the, the, the confined space of the shower is reinforcing your voice, making it reverberate, and so you can hear yourself better. In a, a dead room, you can't hear yourself talk very well. And a room that is too dead will make you go nuts because uh, rooms like these that are depicted here literally have no echoes at all, and so your voice just doesn't come back to you. If you speak, you can't even hear your own voice, but you begin to hear your own heartbeat and your own alpha waves, and apparently that drives people cuckoo. And so uh, we don't generally have those rooms. We don't have one on campus that I know of. Okay, now, sound can echo, uh, and so when sound strikes an object, it can bounce off an object if it's not absorbed. And so hard objects create echoes. And so if you have a, a room with hard walls, you will get echoes. And echoes interact with other echoes, which create reverberation. And so, like I said, if you're in a shower singing, uh, if you do that sort of thing, your voice will sound richer because those echoes are actually amplifying it to some degree. Now, on the other hand, uh, if you go into a very large room with hard walls, then the hard walls of the very large room is going, are going to create more distracting echoes. And in any case, a room that has a lot of echoes is typically called a live room. The room is live. And uh, probably among the best examples I could think of where it could be a problem is a gymnasium. If you go to a gymnasium and you're going to be shooting, uh, everything is going to echo every, because that's the way the room is set up. A racquetball court is, uh, is even worse. You've got nice hard walls that are going to bounce the sound everywhere. And uh, that's going to cause distortions where you're going to hear an after sound of your voice. Hello, 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 that sort of thing. And so uh, that can be something you don't want. Also, if you're just moving into an apartment and there's no furniture there yet, you might hear an echo. And that's because the furniture actually acts as a sound dampener. And so if you, if you have a problem with echoes, one of the things you can do is to bring along something soft, like a big uh, sheet or something, and put it up on the wall. That can actually deaden the sound and reduce some of that echo. Now, acoustics, as I said, is the science of talking about sound. And uh, the science of sound, rooms are engineered based on acoustical principles. And there are people that make a lot of money doing that. Music halls, for example, have very good acoustics. Carnegie Hall was a masterpiece, you know, that sort of thing. And so uh, the building material is used in the walls, the shape of the rooms, those can all be engineered. Now, from our point of view, the more, most important thing to understand is that sound can be controlled, meaning that you may not be in the best environment to record sound, but you can always fix it you know, by bringing in something or by moving things around, changing positions. Uh, there must be a way of, uh, of channeling the music, or there are other tricks which we'll talk about as well. Uh, even simple tools can make a difference, as I said. Now, microphones. Microphones are machines that convert sound into audio files. And microphones are designed to record sound. Now, all microphones have a simple mechanism that vibrates. And so if you look at the diagram here, maybe not the best diagram, you can see a coil. And uh, you know, sound is hitting this, uh, this cone-shaped device here. And the coil is being vibrated. And that is creating a small electric current. You know, and here's another example of something similar. Usually there are magnets involved that create a current. Sometimes there's an electric charge used. Sometimes there isn't. But essentially all microphones do that. They vibrate and convert mechanical energy 
into sound or into a sound signal, which is then recorded electronically. And uh, the vibration creates an electric charge, as we said, and the charge varies to create the audio signal. Now, there are two types of microphones. There are two types of ways of doing this. Uh, and so there's very little you need to understand about this. A dynamic microphone is a microphone that generates its own electricity. So here, I think this is an example of a dynamic microphone where there is no electricity involved per se, but the act of the vibration actually generates power. And the power, a very weak signal, is then taken out of the microphone and it goes into the, uh, into the equipment and it gets responded to by the computer or whatever it is you're, you're talking about. And so the, the thing to understand is those types of microphones don't require any electricity. You know, they can operate without electricity at all. They don't need a battery. So if your microphone does not need a battery, chances are it's a dynamic microphone. Most microphones do require a battery. Those are called condenser microphones. Condenser microphones have a charge in place in the microphone and the vibration varies the charge. It doesn't create the charge itself. And so those are condenser microphones. Now, what is the difference? Very little. Uh, the only reason why you have to know this is because if you have a dynamic microphone, it will always work. If you have a, a condenser microphone, it will work as long as the battery is working. And so if the battery is not in there or the switch is turned off and you're yelling into it, and you're not getting any audio, chances are there's something going on with the power. Now, the other possibility is if you're plugging into a system that has phantom power, that would be the time to turn it on. And so phantom power can supply power to a condenser microphone. You don't need that with a dynamic microphone. And so really, that's the only time this ever comes up. Now, pickup patterns have to do with how the microphones listen, because a microphone listens to sound, and uh, how it does that is going to determine a lot about how the sound uh, is used and how useful the microphone is. And so all pickup patterns have their pluses and minuses. You just got to understand them and then choose your microphone accordingly. And let's just say that microphones are kind of like golf clubs. You know, if you're going into a situation, you actually get to pick the microphone you want to use based on the job. And if you pick the wrong one, it's just not going to work as well. So let's start with the easiest one. I found this diagram here uh, from this thing called Nonprofit Film School, so I'm assuming they won't mind me using it. So an omnidirectional pickup pattern, like you see down there, that hears everything. And really, this is not a circle, it's a sphere. An omnidirectional microphone will pick up all sound in all directions. Now, usually, an omnidirectional microphone has a globe, a globe-shaped uh, element on the microphone. Now, a cardioid microphone uh, is, uh, is kind of a, uh, a pointable microphone, but not really heavily so. Let me explain what I mean by that. If this is a cardioid pattern, it can even be similar to the omni it's going to pick up most of its sound from in front of it. So if you point it, that's where most of its sound gets picked up. But it will pick up some sound from the sides. And it will pick up a little bit of sound from behind. And so that would be a cardioid. It's got a heart shape. Because normally this, uh, this, this looks like a pear shape. But normally it would have like a little heart built into it. And so uh, that's your cardioid microphone. Now the hypercardioid or the directional microphone picks up almost everything from in front of it. It's pointable. If you're not pointing at it, it doesn't hear it. And so, therefore, if you're behind the microphone, it doesn't hear you. If you're off to the side, maybe just a little bit, but not much. And so there's no such thing really as a completely unidirectional microphone, uh, but they do try, and they get such things as a hypercardioid pickup pattern. And... Uh, a directional microphone hears everything it's pointed at. That's an important thing to understand. If you've got a hypercardioid and you're pointing it at someone talking, it's going to get them, but it's also going to get what's right behind them. And so if they're standing in front of a washing machine, you're going to hear that washing machine clear as a bell. 
If they're standing in front of a radiator, you're going to hear whatever sounds coming out of that thing. And so if that's a problem, you either got to move your talent to some place where there's nothing behind that makes noise, or you got to use a different kind of microphone. A lot of people really like directional microphones in stage work. I honestly can't stand them. I almost never use them. Range is also a consideration. Now, uh, many omnidirectional microphones have a very short range. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about this shortly, but microphones that you talk into, those are typically omnidirectional, but they don't pick up anything further than four feet away. And so that uh, gives you what's called isolation. Whereas something like a, a directional microphone or a unidirectional mic or a hypercardioid, uh, that's going to be something you find used for distant sounds. If something's very far away, you can actually hear it pretty well. It's almost like a sound telescope. Okay, now the first uh, type of microphone I'm going to talk about that's used in the field is the lavalier microphone. And the reason why I'm going to lead with this is because I find it to be the most useful microphone you will ever use. And as a matter of fact, it's so useful that I'm using one right now. Isn't that something? This is a lavalier microphone, very similar to the one pictured there. And this is the microphone itself, obviously. And this has some, a nice isolating property. So if someone is uh, you know, 10 feet away from me making noise, I can't hear them. Or the, the audience, it may, it may be a rumble in the background, but it's not going to be very loud. Whereas if I'm dependent on the computer's microphone, uh, I may hear a lot of additional noise because anything on the table or nearby that vibrates is going to be heard. So... A lavalier microphone is the mic that you clip to your clothing, uh, your talent, well, or clip to the talent's clothing. If you're doing electronic news gathering, uh, that's a tie clip uh, that you would clip onto the person's lapel or their tie or some piece of clothing uh, that could make it a little, so it's not attracting attention, but it's not necessarily hidden either. If you're doing electronic field production, you can hide that very well. You can hide it under the collar uh, you can hide it in all kinds of different places as long as it isn't muffled. Now, the actual microphone is called a capsule. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is because I want to make sure that you understand is that if, um, let, let's say that this is my, my lavalier microphone and um, I lose the microphone part and I still got this, I have to order a capsule, which is usually a whole lot less expensive. Well, it depends. The, the capsules can be very expensive, uh, but if you don't have to order the entire microphone, usually you can get the capsule separately. And so that's just a personality, to, uh, uh, not personality, that's uh, vocabulary to understand. Okay, small and easy to hide, as we said. It's omnidirectional. Again, it's got that globe-shaped uh, receptor. And so it's gonna hear evenly from all directions, but it's short range. And so therefore it isolates. And so, if you have somebody standing in the middle of a crowd talking, if you're using a directional microphone, you're going to hear the crowd and the person's going to have to scream their head off to be heard at all. If you got one of these things, uh, they can just talk in a normal voice and everybody behind them will be in the background. You just simply won't hear them as loud. They also can be wireless. Uh, wireless microphones are cool. Uh, this one is wireless. Uh, this, this wire doesn't count. This is the capsule to the microphone. And then of course, the microphone gets picked up by this base station, uh, which, uh, which uh, does so wirelessly. And that's basically it. It's a, it's a wireless system. Now they do make them uh, that, are, that are cable where you basically plug into the side of the camera. And I'm not gonna say anything bad about those because those are great. In fact, you'll sometimes hear me say that the two banes of my existence are anything that runs on batteries and anything that's wireless. Wireless things are always going bad. Things that run on batteries are always going wrong. Well. And these are both, by the way. And so these are excellent for voice work, very good microphones. And I've always said they're isolating, just a, and uh, usually a condenser. Uh, th this, uh, this microphone can't work without a power source because it's got a transmitter and a receiver. And so it might as well be a, a condenser whether it is or not, and most likely they are. Now, a handheld microphone, I don't happen to have one of those handy, uh, but a handheld microphone is almost exactly the same thing as a lavalier. 
Uh, it's got a great voice uh, pickup. They're excellent for voice. They're usually not very expensive, although we've got some very expensive microphones. We're not very expensive. We got some some uh, tip some um, comparatively expensive microphones in our sound booth, uh, which are designed to be better voice mics. But honestly, the radio mics they're perfectly good, and you can get these for a reasonably good price. Uh, they're not intended to be hidden, and that's important because if you're going to use a microphone like that, if that's what you're bringing, you have to you have to hold it right out in front of you because it's not going to work unless you're talking into it. You can't have it off to the side, you know, just kind of hovering around. It won't work. Basically, if it's not like this, it doesn't work. And so, therefore, if you actually want to hide it, use a lavalier. If you're going to use a handheld, then you have someone that's speaking to a crowd and they're deliberately talking into it. And so, basically, that is the, the one thing that's not negotiable. And like I said, it's a short range. You can't, you can't talk into it from far away. It won't work. It's omnidirectional, and it can either be a condenser or a dynamic. Uh, there's some very good dynamic handheld microphones, uh, but you can also run them on phantom power if they're condensers, or they, they have a little battery compartment you can use, some of them. And I mentioned phantom power already, and those are handheld microphones. <laughs> oh, and one other thing, when you're holding them, they're designed to deaden that sound, meaning that if you got someone that does one of these things, you're going to hear it a little bit, but they're usually designed to dampen that. That's important to understand. Uh, ideally, you should be careful like how, how you hold the microphone, but if they're designed to be handheld, that's one of the things that you expect from a handheld microphone. Now, a shotgun microphone, uh, those, are, um, those are a completely different animal. And so these are some examples of shotgun microphones. And so those are highly directional. Uh, they're, they're pointed like a gun. You would point them at whatever it is you want to hear, and pretty much that's what you're going to get. And so if you're off to the side, you won't, be, you won't be heard as much. If you're behind it, you're not going to be heard much at all. So it's pretty much wherever it's pointing, that's where it's going to pick up. And it picks up distant sounds. And so if you are trying to get the sound of wildlife in the distance, that's your microphone. That's what you use. And normally... Uh, you really have to make sure that you got a shock mount. Now, if you look at this image on top, you can see how this is set up. The microphone is literally suspended by rubber bands. And so the idea is it does not make contact with the mount. So that will deaden all vibrations. And that's usually attached to what we call a bean pole. So the person carries this pole and points the microphone with the pole. And so nothing is actually touching the microphone. That's how that works. And so uh, that, that's a, it's, a, it's a great microphone when, when it does work. Now, you might notice that we have this example down here with the blimp. Uh, this is same, the microphone will literally fit inside this thing. And when the wind blows, this will cut down on some of that extra wind noise that you hear. It does actually work. In fact, most of them have these furry things that you put on top of them, which make them even, even more, uh, dampen even more sound. I wish they look silly, but they actually work quite well. And uh, they're held out of frame by a production assistant. You've got somebody pointing the thing. They're out of frame. They're not in frame. And so uh, you should never see the microphone bean pole unless somebody moves the camera too quickly or somebody gets lazy. And they're not always reliable for voice recording. I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't like using these for voice because if you do that, you know, you're aiming the microphone properly. If the, uh, if the microphone moves off the track of the voice, the voice is going to get softer. There's not much you can do about it. Uh, or if there's something noisy behind the, uh, the, the actor, it's going to screw up. And so I'm very, very um, um, particular about audio. I prefer not to use this type of microphone. Okay, now the camera mic is basically a shotgun, but a medium range shotgun. And so if you look at your camera here, and it's got that little mic in front of it, you know, this is kind of like the one that we use. Uh, that is, is a stereo microphone. Now, I'm not knocking it. It's actually one of the most amazing microphones I've ever seen because it's incredibly good for ambience. First of all, it does record in stereo, meaning that it's got a right side and a left side, and that goes to the left side and the right side of your audio signal. It's actually an incredible achievement. And so if you want to hear what was going on uh, in the room, 
that's what you do. You just record that signal and you got it. You got a, a very good example of what was going on. However, uh, that does not mean you're going to hear your actor speaking clearly. So it's, it's wonderful for ambience. What I use that for is just to get the overall sound, which I can overlay over the audio later. If I want to get an ambience track, that's what I'll use. And you will hear the zoom motor. So if you're doing camera moves, everything that actually is happening near the camera is going to be heard, particularly when you zoom in and out, because that's going to make a whirring sound. So, you know, don't be surprised if that comes up. And so uh, that if you set the camera on internal mic, that's what you're going to get. Do not depend on this microphone. Please don't, uh, because it's always going to do what it does, but that's not always what you want. And so if you're far away from your subject and your subject is talking, uh, it's just not going to pick up very well. And, and if there's other noise in the room, it's just going to drown everything out that you want. So uh, please be careful about that. Setting audio levels. Uh, basically, again, we've got to go back to production values. You have to make sure that you've got the best material to work with. If there is a true definition of production, you know, in terms of uh, pre-production, production, and post-production, the goal of production is to wind up with the best material you can get. And so that means if you're the audio engineer, your job is to make sure that that's the best audio that you can work with. And anything less than that is just not good enough. And so speech must be recorded at between minus five and minus three. So if you're looking at your dials here, uh, that's going to come around here somewhere. You know, this would also be acceptable. And so you're into the orange range. You don't want to, you don't want to overmodulate it, but you don't want it down here either. Just because it's green doesn't mean it's good. So you want it kind of near the top of that scale. So if you overmodulate it, if you make the little red lights come on, then that's going to give you an overmodulated signal and you're going to lose frequencies. What's going to happen is uh, it'll go beyond the capability of the recording device to capture, and whatever it doesn't get, it will ignore. So it's just going to clip a whole bunch of detail right off of the sound, and so that's going to give you a buzzy sound. <laughs> now, the level set too low, if it's down here, let's say, around minus 24, then in order to hear it at all, you're going to have to crank it up, and then you're going to crank up all the noise that was in the room, including the noise that's internal to the microphone. So usually you get a hissy sound because you're hearing all of the noise that you couldn't normally hear. And so you don't want the levels recorded too low. You don't want them recorded too high. Simply put, listen to the audio. It's amazing how many people don't do this. So if you're on the shoot and you're operating camera, have the headphones on. That way you know the audio is recording. If you don't hear the audio recording, it's not recording. Or if you're not the one doing that, make sure you've got somebody who's monitoring audio. Make sure that they can tell you what's going on. And so for quality control, I cannot stress enough that you've got to have those headphones. In fact, a uh, long time ago, uh, when I was doing one of my graduate school projects, I went out and bought the most expensive headphones I'd ever had. And you know what? That was probably one of the best investments I ever made because I relied on them heavily. And because you, you always know, this actually sounds good. If it doesn't sound good, it doesn't sound good. And so level control, make sure that the levels are correct. It doesn't matter if it sounds good if the levels are buried because that can be a problem later. Make sure that you get this, uh, that, you're, that you know what you're diagnosing. Avoid automatic settings and limiters. Sometimes that will cause errors. For example, a limiter or an automatic, let's start with the automatic setting. The automatic setting, basically tells the audio device, make sure that there's something to listen to. And so if somebody is quiet, it'll gradually raise the volume. That is so doggone annoying. It sounds like a wave coming in on the shore because suddenly all the ambient noise comes up and then someone talks and they're really loud for a second and it goes back down again. Uh, and so please do not do that. Don't use any automatic level setting controls. Limiters are a little bit better in that they will keep the audio going relatively well until somebody shouts and then they'll cut off that noise. They'll, they'll suddenly limit it so that it can't go beyond a certain point. And that's okay 
as long as the audio isn't too loud in the first place. Because if it's too loud, it won't look like it's too loud. But all of the detail will be mushed up into this little strip. And so it just won't be, you won't get all the tonal values. So try not to uh, let the machine do the thinking for you. And so listen to your audio, make sure there isn't some annoying noise that you're hearing. Uh, because, you know, just like when you're, when you're taking pictures, you've got to learn how to see. When you're listening to audio, you've got to learn how to hear. And so uh, you, if, if you're in a room, you're not going to hear the heating device. If you're putting on your, uh, your headphones, listening to the audio, the camera is going to hear that. You say, you know what? I'm hearing this sound. What is that? Oh, you know what? That's the heater. Turn it off. And so uh, that means that whatever it is, shut it down. And you'd be surprised. You know, shut off the, the refrigerator, shut off the fish tank. Now, of course, some of this stuff uh, can be problematic, especially if you're in somebody else's location. Uh, but yeah, sometimes you do have to ask politely, you know, can you please turn this off and find out how to do it? Because sometimes they don't actually know. Uh, but it makes a big difference. Apologize later. Yeah, because sometimes, yeah, it can be very inconvenient. You know, we were doing one shoot a long time ago in a restaurant of all places, and we had to shut down just about everything because you wouldn't believe how noisy a restaurant actually is. Okay, microphone placement. Don't bury the mic anywhere. Make sure the microphone can hear, can receive the vibrations from the air, but at the same time, if you're supposed to be concealed, conceal it well. And so those are general quality control issues, but make sure that you get the best possible audio for your project because your project is worth it. And if you don't think so, then nobody else will either. Okay, and so that's about it for this particular lecture. And we will talk about how to use and set up the, uh, the microphones on the lab day. And that's basically it.